I tell you, look, there is a real devil, amen? amen? And he hates the book of Genesis. He hates all the Bible, but he sure hates this book. Because why? We said if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Does it, uh, you, you ought to think about this for just a minute. You can grow up in America and go through school 12 years, go through college four years or six years, whatever you want to do, and never know who the first man was. Yeah. Total ignorance. Amen. Total absolute ignorance. No, don't know where man came from. Yeah. Don't know why he's here. And we wonder why people are blowing their heads off. Yeah. Why they wonder what's going on. They have no sacredness of life. They have no meaning and purpose in living. It's because the foundations have been destroyed. And so I want to encourage you today uh, to really get a hold of this and, and uh, uh, I mean, get a hold of the seriousness of it. I want to go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. We're going to take off again here and just review a little bit of the things we said real quickly and then, and then dive right into what we want to look at today. Um, we talked about in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That is a foundational statement even for your salvation. If that's not true, we're, here, we're gathered here on false pretenses today. And uh, Satan hates this verse. It's the foundational verse of, 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 of everything, not only just salvation, but of life itself. Now, uh, we talked about all the different things that Genesis addresses. God is revealed as a creator God, a redeemer God, a covenant making God, an almighty God, a most high God, a possessor of heaven and earth in the book of Genesis. You want to know God, you got to read the book of Genesis. In Genesis, man is, is shown as a created being. Not, not evolved, not chance, nothing like that. Also in Genesis, we see man as under, the, un, under God's law, but also under God's grace. We see man then as fallen, under the curse, sinful, with a heart desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. We see man redeemed by grace and by the principle of substitution. And I'm running through this again just re in re review. But we see this principle of redemption, of salvation by grace through faith in a blood sacrifice substitute. That is the gospel. We see man finding grace through faith, walking with God. Enoch walked with God, a friend of God, Abraham. That man can walk with God and man can be a friend with God and walk with him. In Genesis, Satan is revealed as a liar, as a distorter, a deceiver, a doubt caster and denier of God and the arch enemy of Almighty God. In Genesis, we learn of the sovereignty of God, that God is God. He doesn't have to ask me or you for permission to do anything. He doesn't, ask, he doesn't even have to explain to us. In fact, he doesn't. He just makes a statement. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He didn't go back and say, talk about when somebody says, where'd God come from? He didn't come from anywhere. He's always been. And that's, uh, that'll, you don't need dope to blow your mind. Read your Bible, Amen. I'm going to tell you what, just think right thoughts about God, and I'm telling you, it's, it'll amaze you. And so we see the sovereignty of God in, in calling of Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees, passing by Ishmael and calling Isaac, hating Esau, loving Jacob. And then we see, fifthly, in Genesis, the way of salvation is clearly set forth as through a substitutionary sacrifice, and we've talked about that, the blood sacrifice. We see that in Adam and Eve, that God slew animals to cover them with skins. He rejected their leaves, their, their fig leaves, their works of righteousness, their attempt to save themselves. Then we see Cain and Abel. Cain brought uh, works of his hands, works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Abel brought a blood sacrifice. God accepted that. In the... <laughs> We see the sacrifices of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Noah all the way through the book of Genesis. In Genesis, the rejection of man's works and efforts at salvation. As I said, the fig leaves and the fruit of our labor. God rejects that. And then in Genesis, we see the doctrine of justification by faith alone is taught. The Bible said in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. And that's the doctrine of justification by faith. And that's the, one of the greatest truths you'll ever get a hold of. It's not, it's not that Abraham obeyed the Lord and saved him. Not that Abraham loved the Lord and God saved him. Not that Abraham was baptized or circumcised and God saved him. Not that Abraham served the Lord and God saved him. But Abraham believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. And we're, I hope you get it because I'm wound up like an eight-day clock today. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm tied on a banjo string. 
I'll tell you what, I, I, I serve the living God. We got the truth, amen, and I'm excited about it. I, I'm, I'm telling you what, it's a wonderful thing. Anyway, in Genesis, we see the security and the safety of the believer. When God saves them, we go in the ark, Noah's ark, and God shut the door, and God sealed the door, and, they, and Noah was safe inside there. And you and I are in Christ, and we are safe, and we are secure in Christ, amen. And uh, against the wrath of God that's beat against this world. In Genesis, we see the doctrine of separation from the world. God never saves anybody without separating them. I'm telling you right now, God separates. When you come out to him, you say, God will separate you. Enoch walked with God. Abraham and Lot, Ur of Chaldees. God said, when God called Abraham out, he called him out of Ur of Chaldees. When God saves you and I, he calls us out of this world. We see that God divides light from darkness. In Genesis, we see the doctrine of the chastisement of, our, of God's children. If you're a child of God, you will be chastised, but you are not condemned as those that are not saved. And you can see that all the way through how God chastised Abraham and Isaac and so forth. In Genesis, we see the power and the preeminence and the importance of prayer demonstrated in the saint's life. And I'm telling you, Abraham prayed for Lot and, and uh, Jacob praying and wrestling with God. And men begin to call upon the Lord. And I tell you, that's part of why we came to church today. In Genesis, we see the doctrine of the church. We see the, the women, the brides in the book of Genesis are pictures of the church. And Rebecca is a picture of the church, the bride of Christ. We see the rapture, the doctrine of the rapture given in Scripture. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. And he took him before the flood, which is a picture of the tribulation. Everything that's in the New Testament is embedded in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis, we see the doctrine of divine incarnation. God in the flesh is first declared in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the, the serpent's head and that is a talk that's talking about God in the flesh that God would come in the flesh and conquer Satan then in Genesis we see the doctrine of resurrection Noah and his family came out on the other side to a new earth and Abraham said this in the new you learn this New Testament that Abraham he's, he he considered that God would raise his son God had promised him about Isaac and he knew that if God requested his death, that God would raise him from the dead. So you see, the doctrine of the resurrection is given in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, the Savior's life and coming and exaltation is shown in Joseph's life. Uh, he's a picture of Christ. You can see the whole life of Christ pictured in Joseph's life. In Genesis, the priesthood of Christ foreshadowed through Melchizedek. Who is, has an endless, in, uh, without beginning and without ending. In Genesis, we see the Antichrist foreshadowed by the seed of the serpent and by Nimrod. In Genesis, we learn who the land belongs to. And it was given to Abraham and Isaac and their seed. Not seeds, the Bible says. In Genesis, the amazing future of Israel is made known. That the earth will be blessed through them. We, that we're blessed today through this book and through the Savior of this book. And in Genesis, we see the judgment of God upon the unsaved and the wicked in the account of the flood and in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we see the judgment of God. And then we said that getting into practical things, we see in Genesis the foundational truths for marriage, for male and female. Ain't no such, uh, all this garbage going on. And Genesis will straighten you out, amen. You, don't, you won't be confused if you read Genesis. And by the way, somebody said, Jesus never said anything about that issue. Yes, he did. He said in the New Testament, it was not so from the beginning. He, God created male and female. And if we want to get straight, you want to straighten your family out and you want to have a basis for what you believe and be solid in things, go back to Genesis and go to the foundation of how God created this world. And Satan wants to pervert everything. And so we see the, the, uh, the issue of marriage. You want to know about marriage? Read the Bible. I, I, I could, we're going to be looking at things all about the a man shall rule. You, you know why the world hates this book? Yeah. Did you know it's in Genesis that it says that the husband will rule over the wife? Yeah. This world hates that concept. The world hates the idea. In Genesis, you learn of the patriarchal source of authority and structure and order in life. And this world hates that. The whole thing in America is against the patriarchal set forth in Genesis and the order that God set forth. And uh, so anyway, I've just I said last week, listed all these major themes. And there's more than that doctrines that the Bible clearly set forth and taught in Genesis. There's no way to overemphasize the importance of this book. And that is one reason that Genesis has become a source of continual attack from the devil and his crowd. And today we're going to talk about some of this attack on Genesis and how it has poisoned and uh, neutered the church in America.
Now, in Genesis 1-1, if it's up on the wall there, there's two statements. So there, first of all, it says, in beginning God. God is the self-existing eternal one. He's not dependent on anybody else to exist. When you read in the Bible where it says the great I am, that means the self-existing eternal one. Okay? Then it tells you not only those two declarations, the existence of God, but it gives you the creative power and acts of God. True, true creation, and this is what we need to get now, let's, let's go with it. True creation is to take where n nothing. You don't take nothing, there just is nothing. And the, there's a power, the power of God speaks it into existence. It was not there. And there, no, no, hang on your hats one, because I'm telling you, the devil hates this book. And he's got all these, these preachers and seminary and Bible college professors talking about, well, there's a difference between created and made and all this stuff. And yeah, but you read your Bible real careful. You better be careful about getting into that swamp land. God made it out of nothing. Wasn't anything there to make it out of. Now he took the dirt and the dust and, and formed man. But I'm going to tell you something. Man's spirit. Man is not just dust. He's a spirit and a soul. And God breathed in the breath of light. And so you need to understand this more than this. The creative power. True creation is taken from nothing. Bringing something into existence. That the, where there was nothing. As Dean mentioned last week. About the little old story about the devil and so forth. Now let me just say something to you. It's not my job to get into it, defend and explain the doctrine of creation, but to preach it. Right. Right. Uh, but we're going we're to talk about a few things. But sal and we'll talk in the preaching our day about salvation is a creative act of God. But let's get into some things here. Let's put up 1 Timothy 6.20 this morning. We're going to talk about some of the attacks on Genesis. And the reason I do this, if a shepherd's got a flock of sheep and he's coming, how many knows what Johnson grass is? All right. Uh, there are poisonous weeds that must be, a person does not need to be eaten on. That's why you want to be careful what you're watching on Facebook or anything else or anywhere. Be careful. There's poisonous weeds. Some of it looks real good, but it'll kill you. Now, so First Timothy 6, 20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. What was given to him to keep? The word of God. Avoiding profane. Profane means outside the Bible. Profane and vain, empty babblings. And this is what a lot of, the world just, let me just tell you something. About it. I'm not interested in all your conspiracy theories, okay? I'm interested in what the Bible says. Stay off of that junk. Quit getting wound up. I'll tell you what I've noticed about all the flat earthers and the conspiracy theories. They don't give a dime whether somebody dies and go to hell. But they want to argue with somebody all day whether the earth's flat or not. Bunch of nonsense. And it's conspiracy theories and all this kind of stuff and cl claiming to know something out and beyond the word of God. You know, you'll do good, me and you'll do good to stay within the, the, the realms of the Bible. He said, but avoid that stuff. Amen. Vain babblings and oppositions to that which he was given trust in to keep of science falsely so-called. God's got it nailed every time. God says it's going to be a deal where they call it science. Science is dealing in factual, observable phenomena. It's not guessing. It's the, it's true science is where you absolutely, factually have it observable in front of your face, your eyes. God says there's going to be a situation where they're going to call stuff science falsely. It's not really science at all. So we're going to talk today about theories against the lines, the lies of theories against the word of God and how it impacts the nation. This nation has been destroyed through that process right there. And it not only, it not only infiltrated our educational institutions, but it infiltrated the churches of America. And what we're talking about this morning is the issue of what's called theistic evolution and the gap theory. And I don't want nobody arguing with me here. I'm the pastor and I mean it. You don't agree with me? You're welcome to go to a church that don't believe like this. Okay, I love you. Not trying to be mean or nothing like that. But I ain't going to put up with a bunch of arguing. I don't want nobody in this pulpit or in this church to poison the minds of these kids. And, and it, this is a very serious thing because I'll tell you what, if you let it be done, you could destroy a child. 
And the Bible says that if you offend one of these little ones, it's better off for you to have a millstone hung around your neck. You don't let people teach your children false doctrine. You don't let your children be, you don't put your children under somebody that makes God out to be a liar. You ought to love your children more than that. Amen. You ought to love them more than that. So anyway, so we're going to look at, first of all, now in Genesis chapter, uh, let me just say this to you. To deny creation is to deny God. To deny creation is to deny, deny the fact of sin. To deny creation, is, the account, is to deny redemption. To deny creation will put you into idolatry. To deny creation is to call God a liar. And the Bible said, let, every man, let God be true and every man a liar. Creation is foundational to let us go on beyond these foundational truths. I want to just hit a little bit before we go into this thing of, of the gap theory and the theistic evolution. When you take creation, biblical creation, out of the mind and heart of a child, one of the first things you'll do is to take away from them self-acceptance. Did you know you need to accept yourself? I didn't say worship yourself. I didn't say self-esteem. I said accept who God made you to be. When you take creation away from people, there is no purpose, no, no meaning to life. You're just another blob going through. It doesn't mean anything. What, what does it amount to? When you take away creation, you take away the concept of male and female, and you open up a Pandora's box of, of, of just human imagination. You take away from your uniqueness. Your inner freedom, you take away trust and faith and rest and even knowing how the earth and we got here. You would think that educators would want to study the first man. But you can take your history classes all you want to and you'll never study about Adam. So anyway, what's God's purpose in creation? Revelation 4.11 says we're created for his pleasure. And until you find that out for his pleasure and his glory, and until you get there in life, your life will be vain. Amen. And you may, you, be like, you may be like Solomon. You may bank it all up and gather it all up. But at the end of it, you're going to say it's all vexation and vanity of spirit. And until you get creation is so vital to happiness, to joy, to purpose. It's good to get up and more than that. I've got a purpose for being here. And it is for the pleasure and the glory of my creator. Yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to just throw you a little bit here. I'll get in this thing a little bit, but I got some things I want to throw at you. <clears throat> how, how could you know? All right. I've been around this a lot. There are people and they're well-meaning, I think. And they'll talk about that the name of God in Genesis 1 one is plural Hebrew plural hang, hang on just a minute it is okay it, it is and they'll use that to prove the Trinity I want to ask you a question if you never knew the first word first Hebrew anything Greek anything could you take Genesis the book of Genesis and prove that God is, God is a, a, a triune being Amen. yes you can you see, what they try to do is to make you think that you can't really know the truth about creation and all this. And it's so mysterious and so deep without somebody who knows Hebrew and Greek, to, the book, the Hebrew, to tell you about it. And I've watched this. I have watched preachers use this and sometimes well-meaning. But I want you to look at something with me. You don't need, I'm just going to tell you, you don't need Hebrew. You don't need Greek. All you need is faith. And believe. Now watch what your Bible says. Go to, uh, if somebody said to you, well, uh, God is one and, and, and uh, that's what the Bible says. And it does say that. These three are one. Amen. But it does say these three. Uh -huh. right. All right. Watch this. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, let's go to verse 26. And God said, there you are. Let us make man... In what? After. Did you know there's three pronouns in there? Right there's your trinity. Let us make man in our own image. You don't need Hebrew to figure out that God is a triune Godhead. Just read your Bible and believe it. I mean, I'm just throwing this in. This is just 
uh, like you go down and you say, do you want a cherry on top of your malt? Well, yeah, there you go. But I'm just telling you, these are things that they just need to get off. You don't need all that junk. And these guys that get up behind the pulpit and say, well, in the Hebrew, uh, a better, it would have been a better translation. All this kind of stuff is just to pr promote confusion and to deny the veracity and the preservation of the word of God. So anyway, now 1 John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record of heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Okay? But that's already given you back over there in the hotel. Now, if you, somebody will pop up and say this, well, he's talking about angels when he's talking about us. Well, angels didn't create nobody. I'm telling you, you, please keep in mind that I've been preaching 41 years, and I've had everything thrown at me that you can hardly imagine to be thrown. I mean garbage and try to get you to disbelieve the word of God. And you just got to keep coming back and saying, sometimes I don't have an answer. But I believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. All right, but, but it's out there now. So what I want to say to all of you this morning is this, do not be intimidated by uh, scholars. And be awful careful about what you're reading. Now there's a contrast. Before we get into this, there's a contrast between Genesis and the book of Revelation. In Genesis, paradise is lost. In Revelation, paradise is regained. In Genesis, the tree of life is denied. In Revelation, the tree of life is given to eat. In Genesis, the rebellion of man begins. And in Revelation, the rebellion of man ceases. In Genesis, the first murder and drunkard and wicked and all that. But in Revelation, there's a place where there is no sin. In Genesis, it records the sorrow of sin. But in Revelation, it records that he wipes all tears away from their eyes. In Genesis, it records the first death. And in Revelation, there shall be no more death. In Genesis, the curse enters. In Revelation, the curse is lifted. In Genesis, Satan en enters. But in Revelation, he's cast into the lake of fire forever. Say amen right there. Amen. In Genesis, the beginning of God. Now, so we're going to be looking at some things here. And we're going to get into this, what I wanted to get into. And here we go. Uh, I have in front of me what is called a Schofield reference Bible. All right. And, uh, you know, I got saved. I didn't know nothing. I just knew I was a sinner. I, I just knew I was lost. And I knew Jesus died for me and he saved me. I didn't know anything about all the deception of Satan and how he's trying to fool everybody and lie to everybody. And I was at a conference, which was dangerous. <laughs> and, and this guy got up preaching. He said, now you young preachers, you need to get you a Schofield reference Bible and a Strong's Concordance and, and so on and forth. And said, that'll help you. So, you know, I thought, well, okay, I'll get me a... I'll get me a strong, I'll get me a, a and so Karen, she went out and bought this Bible for me. <clears throat> now, there is out here, and I've had to deal with it. I've had to deal with it right here in this church years ago. Uh, there was, there were gap people tried to literally take this church over. Theistic evolutionary people tried to literally embed themselves in this church and shift the, the focus of this church. And God, by his mercy, kept us from it. But here's what, here's what. Is called the gap theory. Now I'm going to tell you something about Christianity. We don't deal in theories. We deal in truth. So the very fact that they say it's a theory should set off alarm bells in your mind. Okay. So now I'm going to read to you first of all um, what. Let's just kind of go, let's just take off here in chapter 1 and read a few verses. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and morning were the first day. Now, when you go into verses 6 through 8, you're talking about the firmaments which he divided, the upper and the lower firmaments. When you get into verse number 9, it, it, it talks about the uh, plant life and so forth, herb and tree and so forth and all that. When you get into chapter, verse number 14 through 19, you're into the lights, the sun, moon, stars. Now, I'm going to throw something at you. Watch this. This is wild. How many notice that God had already said, let there be light? But it's not till the fourth day he, he, he created the sun, the moon, the stars. Did you know unbelievers will just attack you with that and say, <laughs> God got mixed up. You can get mixed up. God is light. He's light. 
He said, let there be light. He don't have to have a sun and moon or, or switch, to flip, uh, switch to flip to make light. But they'll say, oh, he created light back here in this verse. And, but it's not until this verse you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I've seen Christian people get ripped up about that and go, man, alive. And, and convinced that the Bible make, has a mistake in it because of that. Not true. He doesn't have to have a sun and a moon and stars to have light. And we'll see more about that later on today. Okay. Now I want you to, so it, it goes ahead there in the course of the sixth day and all that. And we're going to get into that during the preaching time. I want to go back to Genesis chapter one, verse number one. And I'm telling you what, this really, really aggravates me. Um, but here's, here's what's called the gap theory. claim that between Genesis 1 1 and the first half of verse number 2 and Genesis 1 and the last half of verse number 2 there is what's called a gap now word it gap theory and this theory says that between here and here we there is an unknown phenomena that God that happened to this earth and to about God and Satan and people that we don't know. Now here's where it came from. It came to accommodate evolution. That's where the gap theory came from. Darwin started his evolutionary theories back in the 1800s, wrote the book. Uh, what was that book he wrote? Um, Origin of Species. How many knows that Darwin on his deathbed said he, just, he didn't even believe his own theory? Am I right, Brother Ira? That's exactly right. Didn't even believe his own stupid theory. <clears throat> but what? The gap theory was made to accommodate evolution. Because evolution said that there are millions and possibly billions of years for stuff to happen. Now I'm going to show you this morning how you can know from the Bible that it's a lie. Now... This is preached and taught all over America. Bible, there's hardly a Bible college that does not believe this garbage. Okay? And they, they bought into it to accommodate evolution, which they felt they could not disprove. Now, I want to remind you that evolution is a theory. There has never, to this day, been an observable factual evidence of, of evolution. That's right. Now, but they'll come in and they'll tell you like we talked and brother Shane Rice isn't here, but he said they started in Missouri now at some of the DNR parks. In fact, I think down here at um, where the big rocks are and the river runs through there, it's got the campground. Johnson shut-ins, he said they, they've now put in things about so many millions of years and all this stuff. Got these rocks laying out there, see? You just wonder where the separation of church and state crowds at who puts that stuff on public property. I thought they wanted separation of church. No, they, no, they don't want separation of church. They, they want their religion crammed down your throat and for you to lay aside the faith of Jesus Christ in the Bible. So anyway, so here's, here's what the deal is. It's designed to accommodate evolution and the extended lies that come from it. So what, what they claim is that there was an original earth in Genesis 1, 1, and, uh, and that that, and that Genesis, Genesis 1, 2, there was this great unknown time period between that till Adam was created and the rest of the chapter. I want to read to you what Schofield said. Now you listen to me. Schofield's reference Bible is considered... In American history to be like you know the standard you would not believe all the denominations and churches that literally take anything Schofield says is true now this is Genesis 1 I want you to listen to this man who is esteemed as a great spiritual leader and authority of scriptures in the Bible he's got more alphabets behind his name than you got in your soup <clears throat> here's what he says Referring to, and this is right here, I'm going to show it to you, it's right here underneath Genesis 1-1. He says, 
But three creative acts of God are recorded in this chapter. The heavens and the earth, animal life, and human life. The first creative act refers to the dateless past. Did you get that phrase? He says the first, when God said he created the heaven and earth, Genesis 1-1, he says that refers to the, what, listen to this phrase, dateless past. Did you know there's no such thing? That's a lie in and of itself. There's no such thing as a dateless past. Do you think God knows everything? Just because you don't know? Or I don't know? I don't want you to take me this morning. I'm not trying to be catty. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm not trying to be ornery. But this winds me up. Because we've been fed. I've sat in classes all my youth life with the charts. Teacher got up, my textbooks, and I was taught this garbage. And I'm going to tell you, I about died and went to hell over this stuff. Because I'd walk in church on Sunday morning and they'd talk about, you know, God made you and God created you and there's a God. And I'm walking into class. Clear through grade school over here, clear up into college at SMS and Drury College, and I'm being fed this garbage. And I didn't get saved unless 28 years old. But whether you want to admit it or not, your child will, will, will wander in his mind what's true, what's true, what's true, what's true. And there'll be a conflict there. All right? And somewhere along the trail, they're going to make a decision as whether they're going to believe God or believe the world. And it will manifest itself. The abortion is nothing more than a <clears throat> surface problem. If people had respect for Genesis, they would have respect for life. They would know that life is sacred, that God made man, thus it is sacred, and all that's connected to that. You wouldn't even have an issue of it. People that believe in abortion, I can guarantee you they have rejected the Genesis account. In a practical, honest way. So anyway, let's continue to see what he says here. The first creative act refers to the dateless past. And watch this phrase. And give scope for all the geological ages. <clears throat> Jeremiah 4, 23 through 26. Put that up, guys, if you don't care. Jeremiah 4, 26, 3, 3 through 26. Now, listen to me. Clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of divine judgment. Now he said, watch this. He's saying that before Genesis 1-2, when God started all this, that back in here somewhere, there was a divine judgment. And, and uh, upon, now why would God give some kind of divine judgment? Sin. Okay. Death. And, and listen to what he says here. The face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. And there is marks of a catastrophe. All right. The flood. But it's not before Genesis 1-2. He says this. There are not wanting intimations which connected with previous testing and fall of angels. And so now, now what, what's, listen to this. Neither here... Nor in verse 14, in other words, neither in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 or in verses 14 through 18 is an original creative act implied. That's C.I. Schofield, false prophet who embedded himself into the churches of America. Says that this chapter does not mean at all what it says. That this no, nothing there implies a divine cr creative act. That's a bald-faced lie out of hell. Amen. That's all it is. Now watch what he does. A different word is used. See, now he's going to take you back to the Hebrew and prove his quote, prove his thesis by something you have no way of knowing. He also buys into the deal. Watch this. <clears throat> a different word. The sense is made to appear, made visible. The sun and moon were created in the beginning. The light, of course, came from the sun. The light in verse number four. Lie. This man is lying, 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 lying. Almost everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. <clears throat> 
It is by no means necessary to suppose that the life germ of seeds perished in the catastrophic judgment which overthrew the primitive order. So now he's saying that plant life was back here, but there was a big catastrophe. But somehow I know those plant lives got sustained and they're the ones that popped up here. It's craziness. Pure craziness. He says, <laughs> with the restoration of dry land, life the earth will bring forth as described. Just, it goes on and on, stupid stuff you ever heard in your life. Instead of just believing what the Bible says. So, let's, um, I want you to put, you got that up. This is what he says. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. That's exactly what the Bible says in verse number 2 of that chapter. The Genesis 1 through, and heaven, and ha had no light. And that's true. That's what the Bible's saying. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place of the wilderness, the cities there broken down the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, and said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Does anybody with an honest heart take that passage of scripture and make a gap theory out of it? No. No way. There's nothing there. I mean, how would you do it? You know what they did? They got the theory, then they started trying to find verses to fit their theory. <clears throat> All right, and I'm going to give you the next one he does. <clears throat> and this is common because, I mean, I've dealt with these people. All right, I've dealt with them. <clears throat> they will ruin a church because they'll plant the seeds of unbelief and you, you can just make the Bible say what you want it to say. <clears throat> uh, go to um, Isaiah 24, verse number one. Now, these are the verses that they use to try to prove a gap theory. I said, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth the broad the inhabitants thereof. How do you get a gap theory out of that? How do you get a denial of creation out of that? Not so. Go to 4518. They got three verses in the Bible that they try to use to prove a gap theory. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established, created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited out of the Lord and there is none else. You tell me how they get a gap theory out of that. These are the verses. And by the way, if you, you get, deal with any of these people, this is the stuff they'll give you. It's not there. You have to imagine that. It is not there. Let me just tell you what, I'll get you just a second. Here's what they're banking on. That you will not read your Bible. That you will not believe. That you'll believe them and not your Bible. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so, if God wanted us to know, yeah. He would have put it in there. Amen. And if it's not in there, yep. you take what God put in there and go with it. Period. Okay. Now we're going to go to your evolutionary class. You're exactly right. We're going to go to your evolutionary class. Now here's what they say. There are signs of and evidence of some kind of class cataclysmic you know, disturbance on the earth. And we have found fossils and dead things. And you walk up here and, and these unbelieving people say, well, now, here's a, here's a fossil. And, and they do their little test on it. And they say, this is uh, 13 billion years old. And here's another fossil and it's 23 billion. You know, first of all, that's somebody locked them up in a lunatic house. That's just, I mean, they don't have a clue how old it is. That's just a lie, amen. But here's what they do. They because they have bought into Darwinism, they must find some exp explanation, quote, for all these billions and millions of years of evolutionary processes. Now watch this. So they're saying that there was sin and they're saying there was death. Now this is particularly the one that they're, they are saying that there was death. Long before Adam was ever created. Okay. And that this is the explanation for all these millions and billions of years of animal and plant life and all this stuff. The evolutionary quote evidence. 
And they're, so, and by the way, they stretch it out for all these billions of years because in a way you can, what are you going to do with that? I want to tell you something, hundred years is a long time for you. Can't even remember what happened hundred years ago. Amen. But they claim, they weren't, and by the way, I like the question. Old boy said, were you there? No. Well, how do you know? Well, I just believe it. So you have faith. Didn't know you were so religious. You have faith. You believe. You have to believe all this by faith. Because you weren't there. You didn't see it. So here you go. They're saying, and they acknowledge, that death, they're saying that death was before this. And all these animals. And they'll tell you flat out. They believe there were people here before Adam. And they believe that uh, there was sin and death and God judged the earth and, and the fallen angels and all this kind of stuff. And, and God just destroyed it. And then he started all over with Adam and Eve. And that's what they believe. But it's not true. Now I'm going to show you why. And I'm going to check your Bibles to Romans 5, 12. John, uh, brother. I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Go ahead. Exactly. Yep. 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why I'm hated in this county. One of the reasons I'm hated because I have pointed out that teachers are going to stand before the judgment bar of God for having taught children this lie. And these teachers, are, I'll tell you, I know some of them that, that teach at a public school on Monday and they're teaching a Bible class on Sunday at their church. Yeah. And they'll excuse themselves and say, well, it's in our textbook and I just have to go. And really, and you'll start asking, well, they believe in what's called, if they don't believe the gap theory, they believe in what's called theistic evolution. And theistic evolution uh, says that we believe in evolution and we believe in God, which is a line of itself. It's not, here, please hear this. Atheist and evolutionist who are pure atheist and evolution don't believe in God, period. When they hear somebody say that, they laugh. They say, that is impossible. You cannot say that you believe God and believe you evolved. You cannot do that. You can't believe both things. All right, so now, Romans 5, 12. Let's look at this. Now, remember that the gap theorist and the theistic evolution people who don't believe the book of Genesis tell you that there was death back here and that God judged it. And, and, uh, and, and so there's this gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, watch this carefully. Read your Bible. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Who was that man? Adam. I'm not going here with this this morning, but how many knows he wasn't the first one ate the fruit? You better think some things through, buddy. Adam is a picture of Jesus Christ in some way. But anyway, where's the one man's sin? How did sin enter into the world? By one man. Who does the Bible teach that man is? Adam. So you have sin enter the world by one man, Adam. Okay, so here, let's just take it down here. Sin entered by Adam. All right, so what happened? Death, all men. And what about that? All of sin. Okay. So what does that tell you? How did death get here? When did death get here? After Adam. To say that to say that sin entered in before Adam in Genesis chapter 3 is to totally blow Romans 5:12 out of the water. So now you have a choice to either believe God or believe these atheist evolutionists and these theistic evolution people. Adam 
sin, and because of his sin, death entered into the world. And death by sin. And that death passed upon all men. Why? Because all men have sinned. You don't have sin till Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> you don't have death till Genesis chapter 5. This is all a hatched up lie out of hell. It's all a lie out of hell. No, no truth to it whatsoever. Ira. You're presenting, but all of them are bunk. I mean, they're all unbiblical. Yeah. Because it requires death before sin. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Your Bible will tell you the answer. You don't need me to tell you the answer. Right. You don't need to read some commentary. Just read your Bible, and it will give you the answer to all these false science, falsely so-called stuff. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just telling you. And you, you know what? If this wasn't being taught to everybody and his brother, it wouldn't. I wouldn't even hardly mess with it, because I don't need all that. I just believe the Bible. I don't need all the stuff, but I got hit with it growing up constantly. I remember a science teacher I had who just laughed his guts out at us in class that believed the Bible. I wasn't even saved, but I believe the Bible. He mocked us. I remember being at SMS and being in biology 101. You know, they, you know, when you send your kid to a school, you know what? They, it's like corralling cattle. They run you down the lane on the school bus. Then they dump you out in the corral. And then they start pulling the gates on you. And the first thing you know, you're running right straight down. They're going to put you in the head chute. And they're going to put into you their poisonous theories That's right. it's nothing it's just as simple as corralling calves yeah. put you right straight through the head chute and put in your head lies against God's word yes right. about 1969 somewhere there my science teacher like you just said at Rogersville now is not in a big city somewhere we come into class and she's got these cardboard cutouts you start off from this thing you end up with a man up here yeah. And she started explaining how it happened. Mm -hmm. And she kept saying, then this happened, then this happened. And she got done with a smug look on her face and said, that's how it happened. Did anybody have any, any questions? And I watched all my classmates sit there. Finally, I said, I got one. I said, where's God? I wasn't a Christian then. I was just a dumb kid. I said, there's where's God in this? God doesn't exist. She mm -hmm. just spit out at me. I said, well, I'm a little smart aleck. I said, you may have come from a monkey, but I didn't. And she had me escorted from the class by the superintendent, screaming down the hallway that I had to have her class to graduate, and she'd see that I didn't graduate. That's how I got treated, because I believed in God. Let me just tell you something about, about the, the evolutionist, the theistic evolutionist, the, uh, uh, all that gap theorist in, in the world. They're on a crusade. That's right. It's not just, well, we, I just believe that personally. No, no. They're coming out of those colleges and they've been sent on a crusade to literally change the dynamic and the foundation of this nation. And these boys coming out of these Bible colleges who are taught all this junk, they're being sent on a crusade to come down and straighten you stupid hillbillies up. That's right. yeah. And I'm one of them. And they tried to say, I got two hands. Ralph, I'm going to get you and then I'll get you. Hang on just a second. It's really, I mean, it's tied to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus said, if they don't believe enough Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe one risen from the oh, dead. Oh, thank you, Brother Ralph. Amen. So what was Moses and the prophets? Book of Genesis right. through Deuteronomy. If you don't believe that, it said you won't believe on Jesus. That's why, see, I don't believe evolutionists are saved. Amen. I don't see, how, how can you be saved and deny the Christ? The, and by, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the later. Yes, brother. Things, uh, if we came from monkeys, why is there still monkeys? Amen. <laughs> Second of all, uh, Paul said it best in Galatians. Who bewitched you? Yeah. Who yeah. bewitched, bewitched you? you? Who tricked you? Yeah. Yeah. After you yeah. knew the truth and you knew it yeah. was on Jesus, yeah. you knew how it went. Who bewitched you? Yeah. Now, I want to tell you what, every parent in this building and every young person better write down Romans 5.12. That is the verse that proves that the gap theory and theistic evolution is wrong. Sin came by one man. By one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. There was not death till Adam sinned and it's in Genesis chapter 5. But actually before that because you have uh, uh, Abel was the first man recorded died physically. 
by the way, when you're reading this, God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, you'll die. He did die. And a lot of people say, well, he didn't die. He lived to be so many hundred years old. He died spiritually that day. There is a spiritual death. He was dead to God. And by the way, if you, I'll throw you another one. The Bible said in God's focus, there is one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And Adam didn't live to be a thousand years old. He died in that, that prophetic day as well as spiritually that day he ate it. I'm just going to tell you all something. I, I, there's a lot of things I don't know, but I believe God's word. Amen. And I'm going to die. God be my help. I'm going to die. I believe his word. And I'm not going to stand before God and shake my head and say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. It's not, you don't want to do that. And I'll tell you what, I just believe. Amen. I don't, that's why I said, I don't like to spend a lot of time on this. I don't want to get into all the, you know, I just believe. Amen. Amen. Just believe God's word. Quit. But I'd have, I feel like I have to, because I know people get hit with this. I had to walk, walk, wash through all this stuff in the early years of my ministry because all this junk. And you, you have, here's what will get you. When some preacher who you have a lot of respect for kind of sidles up to you and says, now, Reggie, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to show you something where you need to kind of get yourself straightened out at. And that, that kind of junk makes me sick. And uh, I'm going to tell you something we don't watch about preachers. Never watch so much what they do preach as what they won't preach. And the moment they start Hebrew and Greek in you, something's up. Amen. There's something's up. Uh, and that's why I did that about the triune God did a while ago. Because you don't need that to figure out. you got a Bible that tells you exactly. You just, you know, and, and I, I want to say something to you. I didn't pray before I started and I should have. And I, I got up. I'm going to pray now. But I don't want you to think that I'm trying to be smart or catty or arrogant or nothing else. But this business is serious. Because if you knock that foundation out underneath a child's soul, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard for them to ever recuperate from it. It really is. And it's serious. And I want you kids to know something. There's a God in heaven. He created you. And you're special. Amen. Now, he created you. Don't, don't let nobody feed you a line of nonsense. You're not some evolving animal. Anybody else got any thought? It's, it's 1040. Yes. I, was, um, I went to MSU 2008, uh, SMS at that time, and uh, Dr. Mack got up there on the platform, Biology 101, mm -hmm. and he spent 15 minutes saying everything you ever learned is a lie. The Bible's a lie. Oh he God. blasphemed God for over an hour straight. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed I even stayed. I did. I'm not ashamed Me to too. say I'm a dropout. I shouldn't even stay. The Bible oh, says, go from the presence of a foolish man when I perceive it's not in the lips of knowledge. But all they've got, I was so worried about all their evidence. And I'd study all the books and answers books and everything. And when I got there, I was shocked. They have nothing. Nothing. They use fear, intimidation, yeah. peer pressure, and exactly. they try and force you. And in. ignorance. And ignorance. And unbelief. Yep. And the, and the fleshliness of your, your, your sin nature. That's right. And all I needed was this book. And exactly. I, when I found that out, there was such liberty. I didn't have to memorize how to carbon date. I didn't have to understand all this other stuff. <laughs> How many, did anybody see my picture on Facebook of my sawdust pile? A few of you? I was working one day and I got this sawdust pile. I went, well, I'd have not put it up on it. And I looked at the sawdust pile and it looks just like all the pictures they used to prove thousands and millions of years, layers. And it's just been there a few weeks. And I put that on it. I mean, it just looked like the rocks, you know, in that formation. It's just been there a few weeks. And I, I'm going to tell you the, 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 the secret in the Bible about the stuff that they use to try to prove evolution is the flood the flood no the flood that god sent in noah's day is all about it and you and i and no scientist world knows really really i mean you can't imagine what happened there the pressure and all that and because see here's where, where does what does oil come from dead things how did it get down so deep the flood brett well I think it's important to remember just to keep it simple. Keep it simple. Right. That's right. In I the mean, beginning, I got to because I, yeah. I'm not a scholar of the time. No, don't. You please know. don't ever be. <laughs> we got enough scholars. And there's there. enough people Amen. trying. There's enough people out there trying to confuse you. Yeah. Yeah. That all you got to do is just is just read it and believe it. Amen. Amen. And and 
Everybody wants to make everything hard nowadays. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. You know, we're going to be looking at kind of the simplicity of, about salvation stuff here in a little bit. And we're going to take this whole Genesis 1 thing running at the message time. But I, I just want to encourage you with all my heart today. Listen, don't call God a liar. And don't, don't weasel yourself trying to play both sides. That's, that's where I got more respect for an atheistic evolutionist than I do for somebody who claims to be a Christian and denies creation. At least he's, you know, not trying to put foot in both worlds. And, you know, because that's just, it's just junk. Uh, so anyway, I love you. It's been good. Let's keep trucking our journey through Genesis. I'm going to tell you right now, we've got a creator God that made us, loved us, redeemed us. Let's just put our faith and trust in him. And, and I promise you this, that at judgment day, all these lies are going to be exposed for what they really were. And you're going to wish you to believe the Bible. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, without it, we'd be in total darkness, rank darkness. I pray, God, that you help us, Lord, to rightly divide the word of truth. I pray that you'll illuminate our minds as we read it. I pray that you'd help us to connect scriptures and associate scriptures together, the subjects, Lord, and read them and study them and meditate upon them, Lord. And God, I thank you today that we're not drifting in the darkness of evolution and gap theories and all that kind of junk that we can know, Lord, as the Bible said, with our creator. And Lord, we thank you that you are our creator and that we're your creation. And Lord, that you love us and that, Lord, you've made every provision for us to have a fulfilled and satisfied life. And I pray, God, today that you would, Lord, help us to have faith and believe the word of God against all odds. And as Abraham did, Lord, not to stagger. Lord, at the promises of God and the truth of God's word. Oh, Lord, today, bless this service, bless these people. And I pray, Lord, that you would be exalted and worshiped here today in Jesus' name. Amen.